Good evening, UFO lovers of the interwebs. I'm Aleka, the resident space cadet these days, and I'm so thrilled that y'all wanted a part two for this. While I don't consider myself a UFO expert per se, I'm pretty certain that the healthy sense of skepticism my dad installed in me from a very young age comes in handy in sorting through all of my research into, you know, sightings to separate the truth from the bunk. But hey, feel free to let me know in the comments if there are any sightings you know I should know about, since I'm not exactly trusting Google these days. And with all of that out of the way, welcome to the top five UFO sightings that even skeptics can't deny. Part two. In fifth place, we have the Hudson Valley UFO wave. So between 1982 and 1986, around 5,000 eyewitnesses reported seeing V-shaped UFOs with multicolored lights flying near the Hudson Valley, just about an hour north of New York City. So the first sighting was made on New Year's Eve of 1982 by a retired police officer in Kent, New York, who originally thought that he was observing an airplane. And hey, it's New Year's Eve. Make of that what you will. When the craft passed above his home, he realized that it was moving far too slowly and quietly to actually be a plane. So while most of the eyewitnesses described a slow-moving V-shaped UFO. Other reports said the object appeared to be circular and capable of moving at fantastic speeds or disappearing altogether. Dennis Sant, a husband and father of five who had worked in local government for 17 years, described it as a very large object made of very dark gray, metallic, and uh, made no noise. The lights were iridescent, bright, and stood out in the sky, and they were three-dimensional. It looked like a city of lights that hung in the sky. So Dennis and his family followed them until he was consumed by what he described as a feeling of fright. A few miles away, traffic screeched to a halt on inner State 84 as a mysterious object hovered overhead. A police cruiser stopped in the middle of the road to uh, radio in about this UFO. Ed Burns, a computer engineer and senior manager for IBM, was driving home on the Taconic Parkway and claimed that his radio was suddenly consumed by static. And when he leaned over to, you know, adjust the dial, he saw the um, triangular ship. He said that the back had to be as large as a football field, and once again, there was no noise. On that same night, eyewitness reports indicated that the object was slowly moving north over the Hudson River Valley. Thirteen others saw it in Newcastle, and about ten minutes later, Ed Burns and at least twenty motorists saw it near Millwood. Ten minutes after that, the phones began ringing off the hook in the police station at Yorktown, and uh, didn't stop for hours. During another sighting, the UFO hovered about thirty feet above the Indian Point nuclear plant. The security supervisor was considering, you know, kabooming the craft down before it disappeared from sight. A home video showing a light formation above Brewster, New York was taken on June 10th of 1984 by local resident Bob Pizzuli. The footage has since been looked at by a number of photographic experts who indicate that the movement of the object on the video seems to be one rigid object and not individual objects. Now, despite eyewitness reports and photographic evidence, the phenomenon was never properly explained. In fourth place, we have Ross. Okay, look, whether you like it or not, Roswell is forever going to be associated with aliens and UFOs, and there's just so much that I wasn't going to leave it off the list. So former CIA agent Oscar Wayne Wolf claims he saw both living aliens, retrieved parts, and remains of alien ships throughout his career. So he made these claims about Area 51, claiming he caught a glimpse of an extraterrestrial spacecraft and a living alien. So once again, he saw a UFO. The 77-year-old man was speaking to UFO researcher Richard Dolan, but concerned about giving up his true identity at the time, went by the anonymous. After he made his claim, it was then shared at the Citizens Hearing on Disclosure held at the National Press Club in Washington in 2013. So the agent is understood to have used a fake name throughout his career in the CIA, so the chances of his real name having been used in the account were never super high. He claims he worked for the CIA between 1957 and 1960, where he spent time in a military base in Southeast US where they analyzed physical evidence. Now in 2013, he thought he was about to pass away pretty soon, so he came forward for one more conversation. Yep, that one I mentioned a moment ago. He claimed that he was taken into Area 51 to look at items allegedly found and retrieved by the US government. He claimed among them was, um, yep, a flying saucer that crashed and landed in July of 1947 in Roswell, New Mexico. Gee, where have we heard that before? He stated there were live aliens there and that he was taken to the S-4 facility. In his statement, he described seeing different saucer crafts in the facility, with the first place he visited holding the Roswell craft. And it was, you know, kind of crashed up, but apparently every alien that was in it died except for a few. And uh, it was really strange because it looked like really heavy aluminum foil. And hey, that matches up with every other description we've had. He claims he viewed the autopsy film, where the kernel on screen said, uh, uh, what we've got here is a great alien that we're interviewing. This man had no idea he was going to see this film, and he claims that the alien didn't like look human as far as the skin tone and the overall shape of it and uh, the size of its head compared with a normal human. Oh, and after all this, he was obviously warned by the CNA to uh, zip it. Look, we can all admit, something landed in Roswell. Ergo, a UFO did land there. Look, did I claim it was definitely an alien craft? I didn't claim that. Somebody else did. But like, look, it's definitely something of unknown origin. Ergo, 
UFO. In third place, we have the Go Faster video. So this video uploaded by the UFO investigative group to the STARS Academy of Arts and Sciences in March of 2018 was secured by a Freedom of Information Act request to the US government. So this video was taken in 2015 just off the East Coast by an FA-18F fighter jet. You try saying that five times fast using the aircraft's onboard Raytheon AN slash ASQ-228 Advanced Targeting Forward Looking Infrared Pod, also known as ATFLIR. I'll pretend I know what a lot of that means scientifically speaking, but a lot of big plain words. I know myself too well, I'll trip over my tongue if I try saying that more than once, so we're just gonna call it uh, ATF. So ATF is designed to allow pilots to track, target, and destroy targets on the ground at ranges of up to 40 miles. It should be noted though that it's good at spotting, but not like engaging aerial targets. Alright, the video. So it's been nicknamed Go Fast by To The Stars, and it starts by explaining the various numbers and symbols that appear in the footage. Stuff like, you know, the aircraft's altitude, which was around 25,000 feet, and the fact that the ATF was pointed ahead and to the left of the Super Hornet. The reader also explains that the aircraft was traveling at 252 knots and in a 5 degree turn, and the unknown object was approximately 4.4 nautical miles away. The video shows the Super Hornet's weapon system operator repeatedly trying to acquire the UFO with the ATF's built-in auto tracker, which apparently can pick out an object and keep it centered on camera. After two tries, the weapon system officer, or WSO, shouts, whoa, got it, to which another person, assumed to be the pilot, says, Woohoo, whoa, what the bleep is that thing? The pilot asks. The WSO later says, oh my gosh, dude, to which the pilot replies, whoa, what is that, man? Now I know, this is where you skeptics start asking, but Alexa, how is this unknown object different from weird government aircrafts we don't know about? Well, all right. Allow me to explain, skeptics, since that's the whole point of this. For starters, the UFO does not have any kind of hot exhaust trail that would be emitted by a conventional turbine engine, so uh, it doesn't really emit any heat on the sensor. And uh, secondly, it doesn't have any visible wings or fins. So through my research, I've learned that even cruise missiles, such as the American Tomahawk or Russian Caliber, have uh, small winglets that should be visible. And other missiles, such as the Maverick anti-task missile, still have uh, stubby little fins. This UFO appears oval-like and does not appear to fly nose first in the direction of any kind of travel. So once once again, this was a video hidden and released by the government. Hello, side eye. In second place, we have the Winston UFO. So time to travel back to two days before my mom was born, so around 11 a.m. on April 6th of 1966, when an unexplained flying object flew around Westall High School in Melbourne, Australia. So Mr. Greenwood was teaching his year nine science class when a girl ran into the classroom, showing that there were flying saucers hovering over the football field. The teacher and his students rushed outside, where they joined around 500 students, teachers, and locals. What he saw was an unidentified aerial craft that was the shape one would see if you had, you know, like a saucer, slightly tipped on its side so that you saw the middle section as thicker than the ends. According to him, it performed several different actions, including hovering at different times, able to accelerate and disappear out of sight before reappearing uh, somewhere else. He said the craft was hovering 50 meters above the crowd, about 1 to 200 meters away, and clearly visible. More than 200 students and several teachers watched the UFO as it descended into a nearby field. Eyewitnesses watched the craft hovering around the school for approximately 20 minutes, and uh, yeah, described it as being a gray saucer shaped object that was about why is the size of a family car? Oh, and um, the Air Force reported that they were not in the airspace at the time of the incident. Just saying. In first place, we have the Cash Landrum incident. So on December 29th of 1980, Betty Cash, Vicky Landrum, and Colby Landrum were driving home from a night out when they saw 23 unidentified helicopters surrounding a huge diamond shaped object that was hovering above the trees. So this all started around 9 p.m. while they were driving on an isolated two lane road in dense woods and saw a light above some trees. But, you know, originally dismissed it as an airplane approaching Houston Intercontinental Airport. Hey, as someone who used to live near Pearson Airport, trust me, you learn to ignore planes. A few minutes later, they saw what they believed to be the same light as before, but now it was uh, closer and brighter. They said that it came from a huge diamond-shaped object, which hovered at about treetop level, and that its base was expelling and that its base was expelling flame and emitting significant heat. So Vicky told Betty to stop the car, fearing they would be burned if they got closer, and both ladies originally got out of the car to examine the object, but Colby was terrified. So Vicky returned to the car to comfort him. While Betty stayed outside and was mesmerized by the bizarre sight. The object has been described as intensely bright and a dull metallic silver, once again shaped like a huge upright diamond, about the size of a water tower, with its top and bottom cut off so that they were flat rather than pointed. Small blue lights ringed the center and periodically over the next few minutes, flames shot out of the bottom, flaring outward to create the effect of a large comb. So picture that. Every time the fire dissipated though, the UFO floated a few feet more down the road. But when the flames blasted out again, the object 
kept moving. So Betty said she had to use her coat to protect her hand from being burned by the door handle when she finally got back into the car. When she touched the dashboard, Vicky claimed her hand pressed into the softened vinyl, leaving an imprint that was evident weeks later. Investigators did cite it as proof of their account, but sadly the photos have not made their way to the internet. The group said that the object then ascended over the treetops and rose higher in the sky and that a group of helicopters approached it, surrounding it in tight formation. Like I mentioned before, the ladies counted 23 helicopters and later identified some of them as ones used by military forces worldwide. With the road now clear, Betty says she drove on, claiming to see glimpses of the object and the helicopters receding into the distance. And um, they said it lasted about 20 minutes. A Dayton police officer, Detective Lamar Walker, and his wife also claimed to have seen helicopters near the same area. The witnesses claimed that after the UFO and helicopters left, Betty took the other two home and then, you know, went to bed for the evening. But that night, they reportedly all experienced similar symptoms, although Betty to a much greater degree. Uh, they claimed that they suffered from nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, generalized weakness, and a burning sensation in their eyes. Also, like, really bad sunburn, which, ouch. Betty developed painful blisters on her skin, lost clumps of hair, and was unable to walk. She was released from a local hospital after 12 days, although her condition wasn't super better, and she later returned to hospital for another 15 days. The Landrum's health was somewhat better, although they did suffer from that lingering weakness, skin sores, and hair loss. The duo of ladies sued the US government for $20 million, and testimony of officials from NASA, the Air Force, and the Army and Navy were given. But on August 21st of 1986, a US District Court judge dismissed their case, noting that they hadn't really proved that the helicopters were associated with the US federal government, and that military officials had to testified that uh, the U.S. armed forces didn't really have a large diamond-shaped aircraft in their possession. And uh, seeing as no government agency whatsoever possessed an aircraft resembling this UFO, the case was dismissed. Well then, thanks for proving that this craft, whatever the heck it was, wasn't of earthly origin. And that brings us to the end of today's installment, and if I missed anything egregious, I'd recommend checking out part one before, you know, letting me know down in the comments. I swear, every time I talk about UFOs, I learn something new. Heck, just today I learned that former U.S. President Barack Obama confirmed that the government has footage of things they don't understand that they aren't releasing anytime soon, even though I wish they would. If you enjoyed my ramblings today, feel free to give us, you know, like a little like, subscribe, and uh, hey, why not hit the bell for more curious content from us here at Top 5 Scary Videos, and I'll see y'all next time, you lovely spooky people. <laughs>